this is gonna be a, this is gonna be a fun one because the yeah. two young quarterbacks, two two great coaching staffs, two great defenses. I mean, what else do you want? What else do you want in Philadelphia at the link? I mean, I'll tell on, you what man. I want. I put you on the spot. I want a coach flip prediction. Can we get that out of you? But just a quick reminder: we got kegs and eggs on Sunday. So buckle up and fire up that grill early, 9.30 a.m. It's NFL Football Sunday. And, hey, we'll put the pickums on hold for the back end of the show because it's always an honor and a privilege every football Friday to have our good friend, Coach John Filippo checking in down there. And, uh, Coach, first off, I hope you're safe. I hope you're sound. Uh, paint the picture for us where you are. I know you're down in Florida. Everything okay down there where you're living? Yeah, sorry, I'm a few minutes late. I was actually outside cleaning up a little bit. Um, I'm in Atlantic Beach, Florida, um, and uh, we're on the east coast, the northeast coast of, of Florida. And, you know, fortunately that, you know, it hit on the, the southwest coast of the state and it got weaker as it came across and it was coming northeast and kind of went right over where I'm, I'm living and went out to the ocean, hooked the left turn up to towards South Carolina. So it was just a ton of wind. It was a lot of rain. Um, like, uh, you know, our porch furniture all got blown out. So that was kind of what I was outside doing. And just, you know, your mind was in another place this, these last 48 hours, you know. So, no, uh, yeah, we're well, very, I'm glad very you're safe. Thankful. It's over. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, we know it's it's kind of impacted the Jaguars uh, game planning and preparation for this game. Everybody had yeah. Thursday and Friday off to kind of prepare for the storm before they depart for Philadelphia. Uh, before we get into some football talk, let me ask you, just in your NFL experience, have you ever uh, been a part of a team where you had to kind of brace or prepare for a natural disaster leading up to game week? If so, you know, how does it kind yeah. of alter the uh, strategic game planning here? Uh, my first game as the offense coordinator of the Jaguars uh, was the last time we had like a hurricane type warning. Um, it was before week one. We were playing the Kansas City Chiefs at home. And uh, we had we had to take Thursday off because here's what in Jacksonville, um, you know, this is kind of pertinent because, you know, the Eagles are playing the Jaguars this week. People think it's on the ocean. It's not. It's on the St. John's River. All right. So the ocean is about 30 minutes east of Jacksonville. You head right down Atlantic Boulevard and you run right into the ocean. So mileage wise, it's about 25 to 28 miles from the ocean to downtown Jacksonville. But my point is to get there. There's a series of two bridges you go over from to get to the beach or come from the beach where a lot of people live. So if the if the wind is over 40 miles an hour, they they shut down the bridges. So that's why I'm sure Doug and, and the Jaguars kept a lot of those guys home was because if you get stuck in the because the stadium's in in downtown, if the players had gotten stuck, they literally would have had to stay there because there's been no way to get home. So you really has is the Jaguars really had no choice unless they wanted to practice somewhere else, but Obviously, that's uh, in my knowledge the only indoor facility that is in the, in the city is downtown. So um, they they played it the right way because I mean the players and the coaches all would have been stuck in the stadium if if you know in that hurricane. So you really have no choice but to, to send everyone home and do the best you can. And and sometimes you know like when you play Thursday night, um, you, you you do a little bit less. You put in a little bit less new, and sometimes you come out and play on a short week, some of your best football, because you go back to, to what you know and what day one installation and training camp was. And hey, at the end of the day, if we need an extra play, let's pull something we did over and over and over at training camp, which our guys know. So um, obviously, it's it's not a perfect situation at all. Um, you know, for the Jaguars, uh, I don't expect that to affect their play. I, I know any of us, you know, football is obviously important. It's, it's what these guys do. It's what these coaches do. But at the same time, you're still human and your number one priority is the safety and, and, and concern of your family. So I think that now that the storm's passed, um, obviously, I don't want to do any light of what has happened here in the Jacksonville area because there is some there is some it's not what we saw in Naples and down in there in Fort Myers. But um, obviously, it's, it's unsettling whenever you have your family here in a situation like this. Yeah, there's certainly a human element involved. And when you're traveling and leaving your family after a storm, you're going to have that thought uh, at the back of your head or the front of your head. And you got to prepare and, and kind of 
decompartmentalize. No uh, we got, you know, Coach John D. Filippo here on the football playbook, like like we do each and every football Friday. And we're going to get into the Jaguars and, and Eagles and, of course, Doug Peterson's grand return. Um, I want to pick your brain on another topic, uh, an ugly scene Thursday night. You mentioned Thursday night football. Uh, the Bengals beat the Dolphins, but this game will be overshadowed by yeah. the two attack of Lavoa situation. And, you know, obviously you've been a longtime NFL coach. You probably know the concussion protocols better than, than I do. But my understanding is they've got to be cleared by a team doctor. They've got to be cleared by a third party on the affiliated doctor. They go through a neurological exam before they reenter the game. I know the NFLPA was investigating last week's incident with Tua against Buffalo where he stood up, he stumbled, he looked like a heavyweight boxer who just got knocked out, coach, and then five days later he's got to turn around and play another game. Not a pretty scene. Just take us through your situation personally being on the sidelines in terms of that whole process of what it all entails, like – somebody's looking to point the finger at someone, but it is a collective decision. Is it not? It is 100% collective. And and the, honestly, the, the player really has no choice. I mean, there's somebody, there's a spotter upstairs. If they recognize anything that's out of sort, they see a guy stumble. I mean, chip over his own feet, but they think they cut, they catch it late and they think it's a stumble. They're pulling that player off the field for an evaluation. He has to go in the tent or in the locker room. No questions asked. And I've seen some players get really, really upset on the sidelines saying, you know, and you can see it on the on the TV copy. He hit me in the shoulder. He didn't hit me in the head. And they're throwing stuff and they're upset and this and that. But there's you have to get, come off the field and get an evaluation. So um, if they determined that Tua was ready to play, there are a lot of people that determined Tua was ready to play. It wasn't just the, the coaching staff and, and the player or even the, the, like a, the team doctor, like you said, there has to be, there's an independent third party that has to clear the player. So there's a lot of people that determine that this young man was ready to play. And I'm no doctor. I never have claimed to be one. Um, so I, at the end of the day, if you're a coach or a player, you, you trust what the doctors tell you. You really do. And, and um, you go out there and play. That's your job is to go out and play and you put yourself at risk every time you go out there. And though I have nothing but the utmost respect for those guys who week in and week out go and put their put their bodies on the line and, and you know for our entertainment and for our families and everyone. So and obviously for their gain as well financially and, and, and you know all those things. So um, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Rick, there had to be a lot of people that said this young man was ready to play, like you said. That's 100 percent true. Yeah. Now just a tough scene, hard to watch, and uh, you hate to see it. Uh, when it does happen. So, you know, the, the NFLPA, they said they're going to explore uh, the situation, investigate. We'll see what comes of it. But that's why this NFL season, you can't get too high or too low early on because we talk about injuries all the time can alter the course of the season. But here we are. Despite the circumstances, your Philadelphia Eagles are the only undefeated team in the National Football League. Uh, you know, three, and know, they got the high flying Jaguars coming to town and we'll talk about Trevor Lawrence, who was the AFC, uh, player of the week, but Jalen hurts the NFC player of the month and deservedly. So, here. yeah. And, and you sat here last week and said the best is yet to come. We're watching the maturation of Jalen hurts. And it seems like every week we have you back coach. This, this isn't talking. one of these sessions, like we've said in the past, but we've been saying it since the, the, the Pre preview in week one. Yeah. I mean, you, it was, you could just smell it coming. You could just see it. Like you could just, I mean, the way the young man played last in the end of last season, you could see it, but that we don't, you, you and I don't need to pat ourselves on the back anymore. Than, than no. We well, Doug Peterson, they even asked Doug about it this week. And he said, Jalen hurts is going to do great things. He's overcome adversity everywhere he's been. And he's a special player. Um, so Doug Peterson had nothing but praise um, obviously Hertz is playing at a whole different level. What have you seen though? I mean, we've talked about it in the past. It's a combination of the overall little details that continue, you know, you stack up the little things and all of a sudden it's a big difference, right? He just looks really comfortable in the pocket. I mean, he's, he's, he's 
he looks comfortable and he looks confident. I mean, he's got the wide base. He's got the short stride. His mechanics, I, I think, with the short release he's got, I, I, has improved from last season. He just continues to do the little things correct. And usually when you do the little things correct, they compound into big things. There's a lot of good players around him. Obviously, that helps the situation 100%, especially with a young quarterback. where You don't feel like you have to you know, push the ball, push the ball, push the ball. But the, here's the other thing and is, I don't know if you've, if you've seen their production by quarter, but have you seen their second quarter production? They're all the 65 of the 84 points, I think, are scored in the second. I'm going to give 14. the coaches a little bit of a break here. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to, as everyone, I, you know, I, I stay up with it because of this show and, and I want to, you know, I want to be as most informed guest as I can be for your show. We love Here, it. the mindset of a play caller. Once you get the lead, all right, is is if there's a chance where maybe in the first half you would take a shot down the field, you might run it there on second and six in the second half if you're up two, two, three scores. Like we've seen the last two weeks, the the, the defense for the Eagles have been playing lights out. So I give the the Eagles coaching staff a credit for what we call complimentary football. Okay, where we're not going to do something offensively if the game is and we're hey. We're sacking Carson Wentz, what was it, nine times, eight times? Okay, we're getting home to the quarterback. They're not moving the football. Let's not get conservative here. Let's still play our game, but let's at, at the same time, let's be cautiously conservative, if that makes any sense. Okay, let's not let's not do anything stupid. Let's say hey, if it's if we want to throw the football, maybe it's a quick game, maybe it's a screen. And you keep playing field position football in the second half until you really have to put the the, the gas back on, which we haven't seen in the in in really, you know, the last two weeks with the Eagles. So I, I give a lot of people a lot of credit for the Eagles 3-0 start right now. Obviously, the players get the most credit. They're the ones out there doing it. But you got to give the, the coaching staff a, a kudos for really understanding, hey, they're playing right into what the Eagles like to do. All right. I'm, I'm going to dig in a little bit deeper here. I don't know how much your viewers and, and Rick, you know about that building. In a good way, it's a very analytics building. All right. In a good way. They have a huge, huge analytics department. Well, what do the analytics tell you? Analytics tell you, you throw the football to start the game and you run it to win the game in the second half. And that's what the Eagles are doing. They're putting up a ton of points in the first half. They're getting up, they're, they're playing good defense. They're, they're, they're putting points on the board. They're putting pressure on the other team's offense, not only by the defense, but now they're feeling like they have to score every drive in the second half. Now you start pressing a little bit as a play caller. Maybe you start throwing a little bit more than you want to as a play caller. And now you got the guys up front from the, from, you know, the Eagles that are getting home and making sacks on the quarterback. So it's been a, if they can keep this formula going, okay. And every week, Rick, there should be a week here. We come up and they may lay an egg. I don't know, but usually it's bound to happen, right? It's going to happen. Usually eventually. That, in a 17 game season, you're going to lay an egg. I mean, it, it, it's, it's what happens. And, um, but hopefully it's it's not this week and or next week or the following week. You know, let's let's keep talking great Eagles football and and um, you know. But the, the there's a method to the madness is my point, which I'm trying to share with your viewers. Like that's what that building believes in. Like Mr. Lurie believes in playing great offense. He believes in great quarterback play, and he's going to give you every single resource you can he can give you to make sure that comes to fruition. So. Again, right now, from top down, from ownership, management, I mean, how he goes out and gets all these guys down to the coaching staff, the players, to everyone in that building is, is, is there's a method to the madness, and that's, and that's why the Eagles are a successful franchise. I think, I think what you're explaining, Coach, is a, a great combination of old school and new school philosophy, right? Because I'm not a big analytics guy. I like it as part of the equation, right? It, it it helps to make smarter decisions, but I think that's what the Eagles are doing here. They're saying, hey, we make decisions based on analytics, but I heard, you know, Steichen and, and even Sirianni say, hey, a lot of it is predicated with feel of the game, the weather, sure. the score, right? So, like, they're not no. taking out the gut check element because no. at the end of the day, your eyes and your gut, are going to tell you one thing, despite what analytics might say. So I like the approach. I, I am not a guy that wants to say, hey, the, the notebook, the binder says we got to do this in this situation. 
it's like, hey, well, this will increase your chances or this is the percentages, but let's also account for the weather, the momentum, Correct. maybe how our defense is playing like you alluded to. So, yes, yeah, case in I point, agree. The, 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 the chart, so they say, may have told you to go for it on fourth and one there. But you know what? Hey, they're not moving the ball on us at all. We're up 17 points. Let's right. punt the ball and pin them back. That is – I always – people ask me all the time about analytics. And the, what I tell them is – is it's a piece it's a small piece of the pie the pie is the win at the end of the week and it's a small piece and it's a guide to help you there the other thing to me where i used analytics a lot was just self-scouting ourselves hey every time that you know we're, we're putting um the y off the ball it's 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 90 percent pass you know the tight end off the ball just little things like that where you can use five or six things a week that can help you give you a little bit of the answers to the test Talking to Coach Flip, John D. Filippo, of course, of your Super Bowl champion, Philadelphia Eagles. And, you know, nobody knows Coach Dougie P better than you, uh, Coach Flip. So, I mean, a very emotional week. Uh, I know it's been a hot topic in Philadelphia. Maybe not so much in Jacksonville, but it's been each and every day. The players, the coaches, they continue to be asked about Doug Peterson, who has a statue erected outside the uh, stadium there. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of debate in terms of the type of reception. And Peterson said, you know, he recalls Andy Reid coming back and it was mostly positive. He hopes that it's similar to that of Andy Reid and that he does hear the cheers. But he said, hey, it is Philadelphia. So anything is possible. I get it. Uh, what do you think will be the reception for the home crowd when, when Doug returns? I, I have a lot of faith in, in the Eagles fans. I, I do. I, I think they'll do it the right way. Um, is tough a town it is. There's still some, there still is some respect factor there in terms of their history. The Eagles fans, I think really respect their history. Um, I mean, I felt that when I was there and you know, people, you know, the, the amount of knowledge the Eagles fans know about past players, past coaches, past seasons, past everything to do with Philadelphia is very, very impressive. You can deal with a tough fan base when it's a knowledgeable fan base as a player or coach. So, you know, um, it's a very knowledgeable fan base. I think once I think before the game, I think I'd be shocked if Doug didn't get some cheers. I'd be really shocked. Uh, but obviously, once the game starts, all those feelings are over and it's it's time to go out and win a football game. And I know it's it's that feeling on both sidelines. Um, in 2018, the year after the Super Bowl, I was the OC of the Vikings. We came back and played the Eagles. And, you know, I had before the game, I was standing there on the sidelines and looked up at the banner and saw the Super Bowl banner up. And I'm like, you know, wow, that was, that was pretty, pretty cool. And and. You know, you go back and it was weird being on the other sideline at the link. But it, once that that clock, you know, was ready, that, that ball was kicked off, it was it was full speed ahead. And you try as a coach and as a, or as a player to put those feelings behind you um, and, you know, take it one play at a time. And so uh, I really think that they'll give Coach Peterson a, a, a really good ovation and a, a good warm welcome. But once that game starts, it'll be like it'll be a, the state will be electric. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I tend to believe that he will get a well-deserved standing ovation. But sure. like you said, once that kickoff uh, whistle blows for the opening kickoff, it's going to be game on. And it's going to be a fun affair because we've seen both of these quarterbacks. We talked about Jalen Hurts, and we've, we've discussed uh, Trevor Lawrence in the past, and he's coming off arguably his best – game as yeah. a pro quarterback and uh defensive coordinator Jonathan Gannon said you know we popped on some game film from last year and then we watched it compared to this year he's just processing much faster he's reading yeah. through his progressions he's getting rid of the ball quicker uh what have you noticed from the development of Trevor Lawrence what are the Eagles defense going to be seeing this week yeah I, I watched that game last week um obviously a great win for them uh, he, that was as good a game as I've, I've seen him play. Uh, I thought coming out, uh, you know, coming out of Clemson, I thought, I thought Trevor was a really good player, a really good player. I mean, he's big, can run, um, you know, very mature, you know, he's married his high school sweetheart, all those things. Right, yeah. So he's a, he's a mature kid. 
very safe to draft coming out and, and especially at a place where they've had trouble with the with the quarterback position here as of late in Jacksonville. So, I mean, he was kind of the can't miss guy. I thought it was a little unfair uh, to tag anyone as a generational talent when somebody comes out. I think that's a lot of pressure to put on a young man. I understand why in today's football and in today's media we do that to people um, because it generates you know, ratings, it generates a lot of things, it generates interest, it generates talking points if the young man doesn't doesn't have success. So I was really cheering for the kid when he was coming out. You see, I've never met him, but he seems like a really nice kid. Uh, he's doing a great job over there. Uh, the last two weeks, I think that he's done. they've done a really good job of spreading the football around. Um, the biggest thing I think that the Eagles are going to have to contend with him is a little bit lesser scale. Is they're going to they're have to cover the whole field, you know, a little bit because Carson's not as big of a runner as uh, as as he has been. Kirk Cousins obviously uh, wasn't too much of a runner. I mean, he'd take off and go, but he's not much of a runner. And 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 the same thing, you know, week one. I mean, so um, I think this can be the first game that the Eagles have defensively that they're going to really have to be concerned about the whole field. And so um, it'll be interesting to see what, 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 how they do. And if Trevor's willingness to take off and go, I mean, he's shown the ability to do that. And um, that will be interesting to see how, how, how they defend, you know, because the other thing is, and we'll get into the Jaguars. I'm sure you're going to want to talk about it, but the Jaguars right now are playing lights out on defense. I mean, they, they are flying around on defense and, you know, kudos to Doug and Trent Baalke for going out and doing what they did in the off season and spending a, a lot of money and, and getting some good young talent there. And then obviously using the draft. That's the biggest thing I noticed, Rick, in tone about the Jacksonville Jaguars is, is this team's not giving up yeah. a lot of points. Um, I think for just from watching them the last couple of weeks, they're, they're not giving up a ton of yards and uh, running the football, um, the opposing team running the football, and they are flying around on defense. So those, that's the thing I've noticed from being down here. And, and that's kind of the talking points here in Jacksonville is, is, is just how much better the defense is playing, playing too. <laughs> Well, they've hit on, on you know a lot of these top picks that they had. Now uh, Trayvon Walker looks like the real deal. Yeah. Devin Lloyd is is playing like a first round pick. Josh Allen uh, another first round pick. So these guys are are living up to the billing. And and we have talked about the defense coach. And you said you saw that game. I I did want to ask you because the Jaguars going back to the offense though are similar uh, constructed like the Eagles because they have a very strong running attack. They do. And two two very different running backs there in the backfield. A little bit more of a bruiser, a little bit more of a guy that can do everything. Um, and I, I think they complement each other well. Uh, you look at the Eagles, and like when we won the Super Bowl, you know, we had a bunch of different backs by committee that did a lot of different things well. And that's hard on the defense, really hard on the defense. When, you know, you're bringing in LeGarrette Blunt, then Jay Ajayi, and then Darren Sproul, that's, that's, those are different looks for the defense. And the other thing is, is from a defensive coordinator standpoint, a lot of times – the offenses do different things with those different guys where a uh, Garrett Blunt is a more of a downhill guy. Jay Jay is more of an outside. So not only do the defensive coordinators have to call the play, obviously they have to have different tags for what personnel groupings are in the game in terms of what tight ends in the game, what running backs in the game. So I think you're going to have to see a lot of that with what coach Gannon is going to have to do this week against the Jaguars is, um, you know, they're going to have to have identify who's, who's in the football game. And I'm sure they have. Hey, Coach Flip, John D. Filippo here each and every football Friday on the Football Playbook. It's what we do here on the September 30th, our last show of the month. Uh, we'll be flipping the calendar. Yeah, September 30th uh, already, Rick, and Tone. It's unbelievable, wow. man. And and you're getting the hurricane weather. We're getting the fall weather here in Philadelphia, uh, which is a great time of year, by the way. Oh, um, beautiful. Do you miss it, Coach? By the way, when when are we getting a Coach Flip uh, visit to the Philadelphia area? When are I we was bringing there you? this summer. I went for the night of training camp downtown, and uh, it was it was really cool being back. It was it was cool. I'll tell you what, though, I will miss like right right there by the facility um, is all those trees that that line the, the the you know Broad Street there and, and all that. And let me tell you something: when those leaves change in the fall, it's you walk out to practice and it's like there's a little Christmas in the air. You're like, oh heck yeah! This is this is this is football weather, man. You well, know, this is let us know weather. when you're coming up, Coach. The uh, Ocean Casino and Resorts awaits you. So, Ooh, baby, 
<laughs> We're looking forward to it. Maybe we can get you on the Eagles pre and post game show one of these weeks. Who knows? Um, but going back to the NFL before we get you out of here, you've been so kind to give us your time. Uh, what, uh, what other quarterback stood out to you, uh, from the past week of September? I mean, you, you can't not talk about Lamar Jackson. <laughs> I mean, he is just absolutely tearing it up right now. And, you know, I'm a fan right now, so I don't work for a team. So, I mean, the fact, I can't imagine what this guy's contract's going to be if he keeps us Ooh. up. <laughs> it's got to be it's got to be even more than the Aaron Rodgers 50 million dollar per year, right? I mean, it's got to reset the market, I would think. I would think so. I I think his contract's going to reset a lot of things. I think his if he keeps this up and they have to pay him this turns into a Joe Flacco type situation where they win the Super Bowl and he, the guys are free your starting quarterback's a free agent. <laughs> you know, this may reset some salary cap. This may reset some some pay skills with the quarterbacks. I can tell you that there's 31 other starters in the NFL right now that are cheering for Lamar when they don't play him. I know Jalen Hurts. I know Jalen Hurts has got his eye on the situation. <laughs> so I can tell you that right now from being in those meetings all those years, there's a lot of guys, there's a lot of talk in the right before you start that meeting about Lamar each week. I can just, I can just tell you that right now that's going on in 31 other buildings in the quarterback room. So, you know, kudos to him. I got to throw out a, a non quarterback, Khalil Herbert for my old team, the Chicago Bears. Yeah. Coming in and rushing for 157 yards and two touchdowns. Um, I know, hey, uh, it's not pretty football up there right now, but at the end of the day, they're two and one. And David Montgomery and Khalil are two of my, were my, two of my favorite players on that team last year. So I got to throw out a, a kudos to those two guys. Well, let me let me tell you my Khalil Herbert story. Yeah, uh, I, I I'm at um, Pittsburgh or Boston College, one of these games, and this is before he transferred to Virginia Tech, so it's probably yeah. around his sophomore year, and he was playing for Kansas, I believe, at the time. Yeah, and, he was transferred from Kansas. Yep. Yeah, so they come in, they're like 33 point underdogs. Khalil Herbert comes and just run left, run right, run up the middle. He runs for like 250 plus yards. That, we was, have our that NFL, was Boston College. Boston College. Okay. So we have our NFL PA collegiate ball scouting call. And I said, guys, and it's, you know, we're evaluating strictly seniors. So I said, guys, we're talking about who we should invite. And this person says this guy, and this person says that guy. I said, I got news for you. The best running back I've seen in college football this season is in Kansas, and his name is Khalil Herbert. And uh, he winded up transferring to Virginia Tech, staying another year, and you know the story better than I do. Uh, what a great runner, though. Uh, Khalil Herbert is a guy. This The best – we talked about Jalen Hurts, the best is yet to come. Khalil Herbert is a real player. I agree, and he's a he's a perfect zone runner. Like – for your viewers out there, what that means is, like, when you run the zone run scheme all the time, like, look back at the old Denver Bronco teams with Mike Shanahan. And there was, it was, I mean, they plugged a different guy in there every year, and it was 1,200 yards rushing, right? And, and you know, and it was just, you some, it's, the way you teach the runner is the, the spot, okay, is the butt of the tight end or the butt of the ghost tight end if you're running to the open side. Now, some teams go inside leg, inside butt cheek of the tight end. Okay, they run it a little bit tighter. It just depends on the team. And you basically allow the backs one cut and go. All right, so the back doesn't have to be the fastest guy in the world, but he has to be shifty and be able to change gears. Okay, so hit that spot, all right, and you're allowed one move vertically. All right, you're not allowed to dance there in the hole because that's where you get penetration. Penetration is the number one thing that affects the zone run game that we're seeing a ton around the NFL right now. So um, I got, I think he's a really good zone type runner. He's fast enough where he has that burst, that second gear, but he's a patient runner. And obviously that was on display on Sunday and, and, you know, we're not moving on from Khalil, but one other guy I give some kudos to was Jacoby Brissett. I mean, another yeah. guy that, you know, has, has played really, really good football. I mean, people were counting the Browns down and out when the whole Deshaun Watson thing came out and, you know, and, and Jacoby Brissett, we talked about. We've talked in the past. We've talked about some guys mental, mental toughness wise. Um, you're talking about a guy that didn't get all the. I mean, Deshaun Watson got the majority of the first team reps, 
in, in training camp. And that's not easy. Okay. That's not easy. And, and Jacoby, obviously, again, we've talked about on the show in the past, the benefit of having a, a number two guy that has played football and um, for situations like this that happen, because as we all know, the Browns are kind of a ready-made team right now. They're, they're, they're expecting to contend. And whether you, you know, I, Jacoby's going to keep them right in the mix and, and that division. And uh, he's done a heck of a job. And, and, you know, kudos to my buddy, Kevin Stefanski. He's another Philadelphia uh, guy, Philadelphia boy as well. Um, he and I work together in Minnesota. So those guys are doing a great job up there in Cleveland. Um, so just, I like to give, I like to point out Rick and Tone. I like to point out like unique situations for guys that are having success uh, because it's the game's hard and it's mentally, it's mentally straining. And those guys that are doing a great job mentally too, I want to throw a bone out to them. Yeah, no, Brissett, man, is he, it seems like he just gets the job done. It's never the prettiest, right? It's uh, but here they are, two and one, hanging around, holding the fort until Deshaun Watson comes back. You know, it's funny because you know you mentioned Mike Shanahan back in the day, and I remember he would take these undrafted free agents like an Orlandis Gary or a Mike Anderson, and they would be this zone style one cutting up. And then they finally found Terrell Davis and right. ran off to the Super Bowls. But it's funny because you see his son, Kyle now kind of doing the same thing over yeah. there in San Francisco, finding guys off of the undrafted free agent scrap heap and plugging them in and, and, you know, finding success with the similar type of system. Right. Yeah. Very similar. And I, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going on out there. I, I think Kyle's one of the best coaches in the NFL and, you know, boy, they've just been the injury bug in his five years there. It's just been brutal for them. And, well, uh, did you see, though, Jimmy G had some questionable decision. He, 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 he ran out of his own end zone. He had the poor interception there at the end. I I got to put that one on Jimmy G a little bit. I agree. I agree. And, and you know, what's, what's hurt the 49ers, too, Rick, is that they are struggling running the football right now. So they are putting a little more pressure on the quarterback. But I agree that, that you can't make some of those throws. And, uh, you know, I'm – I, I'm you can't you gotta be careful with the football you gotta be better with the football than that yeah he's got to reel that confidence level in a little bit he hasn't played in a while I think Jimmy G was feeling himself a little bit too much and uh you know we'll see they got uh Kansas City this week on Sunday night uh no San Francisco is Monday night football so we'll talk about that on Monday Rams at 49ers it's a big uh, game. Lamar, yeah and Lamar Jackson who you mentioned he will host Josh Allen. What a game. Buffalo oh, at Baltimore. Great game. Gosh, Lamar, oh Lamar is ca- accounted for 12 touchdowns. Josh Allen is accounted for 10 touchdowns. This is going to be a 4th of July event, I think. In, no in- doubt. <laughs> you know what? And, hey, I'm going to drop a little bit of the thing about the Bills. You know, people are giving Ken Dorsey a little hard time about his reaction. Yeah. You know what? This game's a passionate game, man. The amount of hours you put in. Let me tell you, if my coach acted like that and I was a player, I'd be fired up because you know what? It matters to Ken. It matters. And and that was a big game down there, a divisional game on the road that, that you know, obviously they wanted to win and the Dolphins wanted to win. And you guys, that stuff happens. You know, people have called me and asked me about the, the D lineman for the Jets and the coach getting into it on the sidelines. That happens a lot. And it, it let me tell you something. I guarantee this next series, those two guys hugged it out and, and that's and you move on. And we've all of us that have played sports before know in the heat of the battle that tempers flare at times. And it's happened to me. It's happened to other coaches I've worked with, other players. I mean, we've all been there. And it's kind of the don't don't hold me accountable for sometimes if I if what you say in a game because <laughs> tempers flare and 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 you just got to move on and play. And that that happens all the time. Absolutely. And I would I would argue, come see me when I don't get that upset, Correct. because then, you know, I don't care. Right? right. I'd rather have a coach care than not care. So, you know, listen. And the player care, too. And the player care. I mean, and, and I mean, there was two guys that want to win that game and that happens. No doubt about it. All right, coach. Uh, well, listen, we hope you have a, a, a safe rest of the weekend down there in Florida. Just a lot of cleanup, man. A lot of cleanup, but other a lot than of that, cleanup. Yeah, lot hopefully, of cleanup, hopefully, but... uh, you got the uh, the Eagles and and Jaguars piped in, and you'll be able to tune in. Oh yeah, 
I'll, and, I'll uh, be right there. Uh, I'll be right there. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm playing golf on Sunday morning early, and uh, I'll be there. I'll be right there for the game, baby. So I nice. can't wait to be back on next Friday and talk about it. Least, uh, I can't wait to have you back. Is, this is going to be this is going to be a, this is going to be a fun one because the yeah. two young quarterbacks, two two great coaching stats, two great defenses. I mean, what else do you want? What else do you want in Philadelphia at the link? I mean, I'll tell you on, what man. I want. I put you on the spot. I want a coach flip prediction. Can we get that out of you? <laughs> yep. I'm gonna say. Now, when are you guys supposed to get the remnants of the hurricane? Are you guys getting that on Sunday, or is that coming through on Saturday? I think it's gonna come late Saturday or maybe Sunday. We're kind of waiting and seeing. So, okay. yeah, well, there might be I'm some gonna, ugly gonna, weather out a, there. I'm gonna say this is a little bit more low scoring affair than than people think. All right, I'm gonna okay. say 24, 24, 20 Eagles. All right, there you go. Go Birds on that. We'll get you out of here, Coach. Always an honor and a privilege. We'll uh, do it again next week, shall we? See you guys. Looking forward to it. See you. All right. There you go.